very warm welcome along with uh, Dr. Vanka and uh, good morning to everybody. <coughs> Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor N. Chandra Sekhar of Manon Nims Mullah University, Dr. Chalapal. I had the privilege of working with him at Bharati Darsan University in absentia. Professor Mani Kumar, who has been my long time standing friend and colleague at uh, Manon Nimsunanar University and former Vice Chancellor. And uh, Professor Marx, who gave the welcome address. And the very dynamic convener, Professor Prabhaka. But for him, I have not been here. He is very insistent, consistent, and he had all the persuasive power in the world to make me come here and made the impossible possible. And uh, Professor Gita and a very distinguished uh, delegates from various parts of the country, uh, scholars, friends, ladies. It gives me immense pleasure to stand before you and uh, share my ideas as a historian. You know, Professor Marx said something from Shakespeare, I'm not a student of literature, <coughs> but history and literature cannot be separated. They are intertwined. He said something from Shakespeare, I, I remember the words of my own teachers. That's all. I think more kind when he says, <coughs> I have not come here to praise Caesar, to bury him, to complete him. But uh, I have come here not to speak of literature to the literature professors. I want to be a historian, per se, and talk about uh, the perspective of the three days ICSSR-sponsored national seminar a very attractive, illustrious topic, that is nation, nationhood, and nationalism. <coughs> that when Professor Prabhakar called me over phone and said that you must be part of this uh, three days national seminar, and I said it is impossible because there are some logistic problems. I said it's not possible because I cannot be at Tunnel Valley by 10 o'clock or 10 30. <coughs> But uh, ultimately, he said the topic is this. Uh, then I said, give me some half an hour or one hour. I said, let me ponder over and then find out the ways and means of reaching Tinal And uh, the topic is so, uh, the reason why ICSSR has accepted or granted the whole money is very simple. Because the title is so penetrating, attractive, and illustrative as well as the need of them. And secondly, you are looking from the point of literature about the ideas of nation, nationalism, nation. That is because I think uh, Ramit Guha, <coughs> the founder, editor of Subaltern Studies, talks about in one perspective statism. Statism is that uh, we write, I think Professor Manik Kumar would agree with me because he is also from modern history, that all our writings are from the archives. The, these records are produced by the colonial mechanism, colonial administration. So whatever you write, ultimately you carry a perspective of the colonial administration. It is inbuilt into the system. Now, I remember way back when the history of Rome was written by Livy. Livy was part of the uh, Augustus Caesar court. But uh, two things he did. He did not consult the Senate proceedings. And he did not publish the book while Augustus Caesar was alive. Both are dangerous. That is because if you start consulting the Senate proceedings, you are entering to the realm of statism. 
And uh, if you are going to publish it while well, Augustus is alive, you know, history is one subject, it has uh, dual effects. It was hope, it was uh, the China's first emperor. Uh, uh, it doesn't come to mind immediately. Uh, he said that all the history books that were around the third century BC, from Qin Dynasty, he said all the history books in the public libraries of China must be burned down. Because history, you know, is not an innocuous subject. It is always appropriated and then used. How it is used, that is the most important. Sometimes when it is used, we call this as it is misused. More often it is misused than used. And there is a reason why it is being used. And in order to get away from the ideas of uh, the fallacy of statism, I would say, the only way is to go to sources other than the, say, state-produced uh, uh, records. I think uh, literature is one such uh, source. And uh, Dr. Prabhakar and his team has perhaps uh, Marx also joined this group, so he's a collaborator, and they have written upon a wonderful title. We historians, we always, so uh, you be, must be, please do not look into this uh, discourse. I'm not going to take much time when I say discourse. Uh, please don't be bothered. <laughs> I cut short immediately after uh, 15 or 20 minutes was given to me. <coughs> no, there is always a tendency to say that the student is asked to write about a cow or a tree, that is what we call coconut tree. But you were writing about the cow all along. And then he said ultimately the cow is tied to the coconut tree. That syndrome I do not want to get into. I will be historian and it is historian's perspective that I am going to share about nation, nationhood as well as nationalism. <coughs> we normally use two terms. One is freedom struggle and the national movement. Sometimes overlap, sometimes overlap. But freedom movement is a broad canvas where you bring in all anti-colonial struggle right from the beginning, and including national movement, because as uh, it has been well pointed out, English literature and uh, English education has made us to understand the ideas of the concept of nation and the necessity of nationalism. So right from 1885 onwards, we have this concept of nation and nationalism given birth. It was the other way, now that you say it is, India is a nation in the making. He said it in 1905. And he was also talking about Swaraj at the same time. But here, normally you should have nationalism first, to give recognition to nation. Ultimately, you attain nation. The classic examples from the Eurocentric perspective are we have German unification, where Napoleon uh, brought 333 states into 33 states, and uh, also Zolferin, that is Customs Union, aided the unification of uh, Germany. Of course, it was more done by blood, the policy of blood and iron, than policy of consent as stated by this model. And then you have Italian unification. Prince Metternich said, Italy is a mere geographical expression. It was related to five states, because Italy ruled the world, you know very well. Italy ruled the world, Roman civilization. So we find in both the cases, the idea of nation existed, and then the idea of nationalism emerged, and then they attained the nation. In the context of India, understanding Indian nationalism and the fight for nation and nationhood, we have several theories. We have the imperialist theory, 
And then we have the nationalist theory, we have Marxist theory, we have Cambridge historians contributing their own perspective, and ultimately the subaltern studies. Now I'm not going into the details, but there I would like to just touch upon the tip of the iceberg and say, of course, the imperialists, starting with James Mill, I'll be touching upon him later. They gave the, the colonial perspective, how the colonial rule was beneficial to Indians. Of course, the nationalists counted this like uh, we have uh, Karachan, Asi Majumda, and others. Of course, Marxists, they said it is the economic, principally the East India Company was a trading organization. India was taken over by a trading organization. And hence, the prime motive was economic gains by Britain, and there is no uh, second thoughts to it. But Cambridge historians who borrowed the Nemia ideology, structure of politics, published in 1929, they gave a different perspective, particularly Wash, personally, Washbrook and Baker are very really good. I think uh, Professor Manikumar, perhaps in his long career, must have met either uh, Baker or Washbrook. They are good friends of uh, Indian historians. But Washbrook, in his book, he says, between 1897 and 1916, there was not even a single anti-British dog barking in the streets. You know very well, Honorable Vice Chancellor made a reference to Subramanya Bharati and Vivo Chandran Pillai of this region. So without both of them, you cannot think of national movement of freedom struggle in Tamil. Whenever you say, that is the reason why we call Subramanya Bharati as a nationalist point. The ideas of Subramanya Bharati pervaded the entire length and breadth of India. So, the ideas of nationalism existed, but nowhere in the entire text of 300 pages, Washbrook uses the word nationalism, the book, say it starts from 1897 to 1916, ends with 1916. The core period of what we call the early stages of Indian nationalism, and then Swadeshi movement, and also it uh, covers Home Rule movement. But nowhere in the text you will find the word that. But it requires, it requires an excellent uh, control over methodology, most important. I think any scholars here should know how methodology can really give you a perspective. How methodology can give you a perspective, as if nationalism did not exist. So you can write like that throughout. Uh, and nationalism for gains. The client and practice nex nexus was there. This is the idea that was projected. Of course, subaltern studies said it should be an horizontal mobilization, not a vertical mobilization. But uh, our question is, in understanding national movement as said, you know, James Mill, writing British History of India, has painted the pre-colonial or pre-British India in dark colors. And uh, he used the J.B. Bentham's concept of utilitarianism. He said British rule was ultimately beneficial to the Indian masses, India. The question is, the concept of India was created by the British. That is the reason why even before East India Company could become a territorial power in India after 1757, they named that company as East India Company. The, the concept of India is already embedded in the minds of the British. Of course, even other uh, nations also made it as Indies. But here, the British had a very clear perspective. And the question is whether they achieved it. That whether, as uh, we have to believe James Mill, whether they were able to achieve the nation or India 
because when they left India in 1947, there were 11 British provinces they were controlling from Quetta to Chittagong, from Kashmir to Kanyakumari. That is now three nations, 11 British provinces, occupying nearly 80% of the territory. But rest of the 20% of the territory consisted of 566 princely states and Portuguese on club and French on club. So when they left India, they did not have a united India. In the entire history of India, no king, no dynasty ruled the entire India. You can learn from. No king, no dynasty. They ruled majority parts of India. That's right. But not the entire India, including the British. So James Mill's idea of providing a nation is not uh, correct in my perspective. And secondly, whether the Indians, was, how it was made easy when all other countries were fa facing after decolonization, several cataclysms in their countries. But India very smoothly welded into the nation even though uh, we speak different languages. We speak different languages, we profess different cultures, but yet we welded into a nation. The idea of oneness, it is not revisionism that I am talking, but what I talk is historical facts. So the South was visible to the North, most important. South was visible to the North. We have uh, Ashokan inscriptions. The 13th Rock Edict of Ashoka at Shabaswari, which is now in Pakistan, talks about Chara Chora Pandit. They don't say Chara, but say Kerala Pandit. And you have references in Mahabharata. And uh, the Hathikunfa inscription of 1st century AD talks about Chara Chora Pandit of 118 years old. The most important thing is we do not have communication in those days as we do have now. But yet, the visibility of South was there for the North. Why should they, first of all, document? That's the most important. If they don't have the Pan-India identification, why should they document the, the southernmost tip of India, the rulers who are ruling southernmost tip of and similarly, in Sangam literature, you have Arana Nuru songs. If I remember correctly, it is 165, song number 165, 75. You have, yeah, Agam songs are mostly, uh, say, very personal songs. A young lady who was married uh, recently was talking to her uh, friend. She was saying that my husband has gone on a trade mission to Patiputra. What has prevented him from reaching my place? Whether it is the gold of the Nandas immersed in Ganges. I'm talking about the Sangam literature, the core of Sangam literature. How is it possible for uh, this is spoken from the mouth of a common lady, that's the most important. Not an edict of a king, not an edict like uh, Ashoka, like Kathakun, for instance. So, which means even common people knew the existence of the polity at Pataliputra and, uh, of course, the resources they command. And uh, you, you have uh, the literature, for example, Ramayana. Why should uh, dealing with Chola period, Kambal should uh, give you a, a Tamil version of Ramayana. After all, we may give you a different versions. But yet, why? What made him to write? If you say it is a, it is a made uh, the epicenter is Ayodhya, then why should it be written here in Tamil? So again, uh, the, the point is that whatever uh, the James Mill or imperialist historians have given the Eurocentric epistemology is to be taken with a pinch of salt and of course all the references that you are going to make here during this next three days is going to vindicate this position. 
At the same time, there is another perspective that English education gave us, uh, made us understand nationalism. So while trying to understand English education, there are two important things we must remember. One is, English education must be understood that uh, one half was given by missionaries. The other half was controlled by the government. So there is a distinction between the missionary education and uh, the English uh, education given by the government. The distinction is, the missionary education gave a liberal education. I will give you two instances. One is, when Swami Vivekananda as Narendra Dutta was studying at Scottish Missionary College, the philosophy teacher was absent. So the, in those days the principals used to go on uh, rounds. Even my days as student, the principal used to go on uh, rounds. He entered the class of Narendra Dutta, that is Vivekananda. He found no teacher. He said, whose class is this? He said, philosophy. He started teaching philosophy. So somebody said, uh, Marx said, and also Provoker said, Professor Rajendran is known to us not as a Vice Chancellor. It's only three years. But quite so. But only as a historian and as a teacher, I'm really proud. Because basically I am a teacher. Even today that's what I profess. And that is the reason why I am just um, making my points to you as a teacher, not as a Vice Chancellor. So the principal started talking about philosophy. Suddenly at one point Narendra has said, Sir, I do not understand this particular term, ecstasy. Could you please explain better? You know, philosophy is one thing that uh, we have phenomenon and norm. And philosophy falls to, into the realm of norm. You understand the norm and then only touch norm and only through your mind. Whether it is Western philosophy or political science or uh, Advaita, Advaita, you touch only through your mind. You cannot have empirical examples. So the principal William Hart said, Narendra Dutta, if you want to understand this, go to Dakshineshwar. Every day there is a priest goes into trance, experiencing ecstasy. And it was this principal, Scottish principal, who drove Narendra Dutta to Dakshineshwar, where he met Guru Ramakrishna Pandavas. And the MCC, Madras Christian College, in 1907, the history department was organizing a history association seminar, mind you, it's undergraduation. There, a student was presenting a paper on French Revolution. The audience were the director of collegiate education, now we say, those days it is the DPI, Director of Public Instructions. Director was there and the principal was there. The student was presenting a paper on French Revolution. At the end he said, of course, the tyrannical rule has come to an end in France, but he stopped it. Immediately, the, prince, uh, the director of college education stood up and said, this is amounting to castigating my, uh, His Majesty's government or Her Majesty's government as tyrannical. So he walked out of the room and wrote to the chief secretary saying all the funds must be stopped and the student must be punished. This is on record. What I am talking to you is on record. I am the principal was tactful enough. Again, a Scottish man, he missionary, he wrote back to the government. The student has said something uh, out of ignorance and we will take appropriate action. And the student was not, not punished. Mostly. Punished in the name of punishment, but not punished in the literal sense. Another important thing is, there was a circular from government of India, government is British government, rice list circular. It says two things must be very careful while teaching. One is the ideas of nationalism. This is government. 
I'm talking about government. The first one was missionary. This is government institutions. This circular was sent to all the provinces. And the principals were asked to inform all the teachers of uh, all the teachers, particularly teachers of history and economics. They should no, make no reference to the ideas of nationalism, European nationalism, particularly German and Italian. And brain theory should not be taught in economics. Again, what I am telling you is in black and white, this is a uh, confidential public educational, I mean educational geo that is available in Meta. What else to teach? You teach Lee Warner, citizen of India. Lee Warner has translated many of the, the Sanskrit uh, slokas which says obedience first, obedience second, obedience last, as Mussolini. Nothing against the state, nothing outside the state, everything is within the state. So this is the idea and the, there were, uh, say, oratorical competitions held, essay competitions were held, the benefits of British Union. Again, I'm telling you, all the papers which were supporting British Union only subscribed. So, you must know from history, I think it was Cicero who said, if you do not know what took place before you were born, you will, run, you will remain a child forever. So history sometimes, again, invoking history is dangerous, but still it is, it is an eye-opener on many occasions. You know, in literature, somebody made a reference to 1857. It was Veer Savarkar who wrote this uh, first war of Indian independence. This is a great contestant, whether it is the first war of independence, different thing. But most important thing is it was written in Marathi, but translated into English. And there was a Tamil translation also. There is a Tamil translation also of this. And the people who supported him in this venture in London were uh, VVSIR and then, of course, you have MPT Acharya, MPT Thirmal Acharya, who we consider him as a person who went, uh, who had links with almost all the countries like Russia, Germany, and other regions. This is again a very important thing because this 1857 book became almost a Bhagavad Gita for INA soldiers. For INA soldiers in the barracks, they were reading this book for inspiration. This is on record again. This is on record again. And this book was banned in India, but it was clandestinely brought within inverted commas into India by Pickwick papers. They were posted. And there is also a very interesting, uh, uh, say, episode. Because Pondicherry was a French author. So all the revolutionaries like uh, Subramanya Bharati, um, Arbinda Ghosh, they went to, they took asylum in the French on from. And the literature was disseminated from French Pondicherry into Tamil, or Tamil speaking region, which were under British control. This, uh, the, the British police could not really find out how it is being uh, transported. They had all the uh, checks and uh, mechanisms to check the infiltration of such literature. But it was revealed after the, the Ash murder, which took place here in Tamil Nadu, one of the Nilaganda Brahmachari was disposing everything to the government officials, especially the police. It is recorded. He said two passengers would start from Pondicherry, one would travel in second class, the other would travel in third class. The third class passenger would carry all the literature or what we call again inverted comma seditious literature. The second class passenger would carry a box with bo false bottom, it is divided into half. And the first uh, second class passenger's boxes are examined and sealed, it is sealed. When they reach Kandamandaram, 
the third class passenger would exchange all his uh, literature with the second class passenger by opening the false bottom and then the class are exchanged to the third class passenger. And this is how the literature flowed into the nation. You should know the, how they, they use appropriate technology also sometimes. So this is not only the writings, not only the writings. Uh, because I feel personally the circulation of English newspapers are very limited, very, very limited. The reason, of course, Arvind Ghosh, who is the architect of uh, passive resistance and all his uh, writings, corrected writings of Arvind Ghosh are published in 35 or 36 volumes. The great master of English language, no doubt about it. But yet, uh, why Gandhiji became so popular? Apart from uh, his own impact that he made in Hind Swaraj, but Gandhiji spoke the language of it. Gandhiji spoke the language of it. And Hind Swaraj, which was written in 1912, traveled from London to South Africa, which was banned first. And then, of course, in 1938, again, it was published with uh, Gandhiji's say, a preface is also there, a short preface is also there. There, the chapter 13, very clearly indicates the impact or the necessity of non-violence attack. <coughs> he was able to implement it. In 1920 or 21, he launched non-cooperation movement. At the height of the movement, he altered it when 22 policemen were burnt alive. <coughs> to the consternation of his young disciples like Subhash Chandra Bose and uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. But later in 1930, when the SALT Satyagraha was launched, this march from Dandin, Sabramati to Dandin, he was arrested, all the leaders were arrested, and Webb Miller, who was covering for Washington Post, he writes, the volunteers in three in a row, when they crossed the barricade, immediately they were lati charged. Their white uh, kurtas became red. Crimson. I was overcome by important rage. This, was, this is how uh, Webb Miller records. But think of the difference between the uh, 1922 struggle, non cooperation movement, and 1930s. Think of the person who was standing in the 10th row and what would happen if he crosses the barricade because he's already witnessing. People are being beaten and heads are broken and immediately blood is losing from their heads. But yet, they submitted very meekly. And Gandhiji also said, non-violence is not cowardice. You need extreme courage for uh, non-violence. I think this is again, he makes it very clear, um, apart from his own experiments with truth, with his own autobiography, I think uh, King Swaraj is a classic example of his own tenets and uh, the methods of operation. I'm sure the next two, three days, there are several discourses on the national movement from different parts of India. I think this would add up to the, not only literature, but also understanding the very nuances of nationalism, nationhood and uh, nation in this country. I am happy to inaugurate and also participate in the inaugural function. I would like to thank Honorable Vice Chancellor for his patient, uh, not only patient hearing, he waited till I was able to reach uh, uh, University. I would like to thank the Department of History and Prabhaka for uh, this dogged determinism to bring me here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time.